and I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Bill, uh, KC0FHN. He's the president of the Deep Space Exploration Society, or DSES. And DSES is a Colorado-based nonprofit uh, organization dedicated to practical astronomy um, and also uh, to uh, education of space science for students and general public and society members. Uh, the major project they'd be working on is restoring and operating a 60-foot uh, dish antenna for radio astronomy and amateur radio experimenting. The uh, site is located in Cuyahoga County in Colorado. Since 2009, their volunteer members have been working hard to restore and modernize the antenna and its support facilities. DSS also supports radio astronomy and amateur radio projects with smaller antennas. Uh, Bill has <clears throat> behind him about 35 years of computer storage, hardware and power systems, engineering management. And his goal is to make DSS a world-class amateur radio astronomy organization focused on space education, scientific learning, and also have fun doing something unusual. And that's for sure. Bill will provide us with the details of the dish's story, its uses, and perhaps uh, some more future opportunities for EME. So with that, Bill, I'd like you to uh, take over and uh, uh, share your screen. Okay, very good. Uh, you'll have to give me the share and then we'll do it. It says I disab I'm disabled. So you'll have to unshare yours and uh, there we go. All right, very good. Okay, can you see that? Yes, sir. Yes. And that should, should be a full screen, I think. Um, okay, we're uh, DSES and what I've done here is I've, we didn't have an open house this year. We usually have an open house in, um, in August around the Perseid meteor shower. And this year with the virus, we weren't able to do it. And so we did this, uh, I put together this virtual open house and I hope you enjoy it. And then I hope to use it uh, in the future to keep people informed about what we're doing. So to quote Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, who are those guys? What are we doing down there in Haswell, Colorado? We've got a website that uh, details everything that we're doing. We post everything we do up on this dses.science website. Please don't go to the dses.org website because that's the old website that we no longer have control of. And we're trying to get that fixed and get a link over to this one, but uh, eventually we'll do that. So like Paul was saying, our charter for the Deep Space Exploration Society, we're a nonprofit organization, uh, 5013C, and we're dedicated to practical astronomy, space science, and radio education for students, the general public, and our society members. We own and operate a well-built 60-foot radio telescope dish near Haswell, Colorado. Tell you something a little bit about the history of this dish. The twin 60-foot dish parabolic uh, antennas near Boulder and the 60-foot dish in Hausmel were originally part of a network of sites built for the National Bureau of Standards, which is now NIST. This was for their Central Radio Propagation Laboratory to study tropospheric scatter propagation sponsored by the Air Force. The antenna sites were located from Colorado to, to Arkansas. Our Haswell dish is somewhere in the middle. A little bit about the history. The goal of the original study was to compile a standard communication handbook of accurate reference materials so that any group desiring to establish uh, such a communication system anywhere in the world would have the data necessary for the site selection and construction. And the study lasted between 1958 and 1974. The information gathered supported communication systems for the distant early warning radar or the dew line. The dish construction was underway in late 1957 and the Haswell land was apparently leased until the purchase by the government in 1963. And the Haswell site was operated up until about 1974 when it was abandoned and surplused. For those of you that uh, don't know what tropospheric scatter is, if you consider tropospheric scatter as a microwave communication system above, beyond the horizon, 
and it was developed in that same time frame I just talked about in the late 1950s through the uh, 1970s. The idea here was to have uh, high-speed microwave communication so they could send data over the links. So if I have a station here, T1, and we have a directed beam up through the horizon uh, into a volume of atmosphere up over the horizon, and the uh, intermediate station, I, I1 here, has a, a, a directed antenna looking back at that same volume of atmosphere, the scatter from the atmospheric particles and atmosphere, uh, they would be able to pick that up and then rebroadcast it and repeat that around a network. And so that was kind of the idea of what they were doing. As with many of these government programs, uh, little expense was spared to achieve the program goals. For exam example, the uh, original specification of 60 foot dish stated the maximum deviation of the surface from a true parabola shape shall be no greater than a quarter inch at any point on its surface. The parabolic re reflector is to operate with full precision in winds up to 30 miles an hour and slightly reduced precision in winds of 50 miles an hour. The reflector when properly secured shall be capable of withstanding winds of 120 miles an hour with a maximum radial ice formation of three inches. So imagine that three inches of ice on the dish and it'll stand, still stand 120 mile per hour wind. Now, if you thought about our environment in Haswell, that's not such a far-fetched specification. Here's a picture of uh, Ray Uberekin, who's on the call here, standing in the middle of the dish. Uh, there's the hatch to get up into the dish. Uh, these poles that you see going up, those are the support poles. Those are made out of a uh, wrapped fiberglass and they support our feed point at the, at the apex. Here's Ray inspecting the mounting point of one of, the, one of the feed point poles. If you look at the dish structure, this structure is quite incredible. Uh, the dish itself I've been heard is rumored to weigh 65 tons. Uh, this is made out of uh, 10 inch and eight inch aluminum pipe that's heliarc welded to government specifications for the entire structure. And that's what gives it that super rigidity and flatness uh, to the parabola. And then uh, also the capability of withstanding those, those wind loads. So the specification for this antenna, I think I skipped one, let me back up one. No, that's good. Has a practical frequency range of about 400 megahertz to two gigahertz. Uh, we could go possibly to 10 gigahertz, haven't tried that yet, but we know we can easily do two. Has a diameter 60 feet, an antenna gain at one gigahertz of 42 and a half dBi. The bean width is uh, 2.6 degrees at 400 hertz or 400 megahertz and 0.8 degrees at 1.2 gigahertz. So when we do EME at uh, 1296, we've got a beam width of about 0.8 degrees, which is just right to pretty much illuminate the entire moon. Has low noise temperature, it's full, uh, full hemisphere coverage and has a uh, pretty fast slew rate of 40 degrees per minute. Tell you a little bit about the organization history. The organization was originally formed in 1991 in Boulder County. The members started to restore the twin 60 foot parabolic dish antennas at the T-22 site on Table Mountain, about 10 miles north of Boulder. There was considerable success with this facility using the talents of the professionals and university students in the area. Unfortunately, Table Mountain is a secure government research site, and after 9-11, more conservative management closed the site to amateur use. The DSES needed to find a new home. And that brings us to Haswell. The Haswell site laid, laid dormant from 1974 to 2009. It fell prey to the elements of vandalism and theft of much of the infrastructure of copper. The, the original large three-phase overhead power lines were removed to better facilitate farming around the area. Sometimes during this long period, Paul, Paul Plishner, a prominent radio and radar contractor, purchased the site from government auction. Probably realizing the impracticality of restoring the site, he offered it up for sale for several years but found no buyers. And when the DSES group had to leave the Table Mountain site, they asked Mr. Plishner if they could 
be the custodians of the Haswell site and do some restoration. He agreed and they moved an operations and communications trailer and some of their equipment to Haswell. I'm gonna stop there, any questions so far? Okay, here's a, a picture of the site in 1972. Not only did they do tropospheric scatter uh, studies at the site, they did VHF studies at the site and other radio studies. And this 500 foot tall tower was part of that. There's also 300, three phase 900 amp service at the site with these towers in the background. That's all been taken out now. And that tower is missing. So in 2009, the members, member volunteers, they've been working since then to restore and modernize the antenna and its support facilities. After making some progress on this restoration, the group president asked Paul Plishner if he would consider donating the dish to the DSCS organization, and he did. And so the, for this generous donation, the site was named the Paul Plishner Radio Astronomy and Space Sciences Center. Mr. Plishner passed away in November of 2016 his generosity is still greatly appreciated by the organization. And his legacy will live on for many years as the site is brought to full operational status as a science discovery and educational center. Because the site had no power, uh, we had to do uh, solar energy for the electronic sensors, computers, the lights, the sump pumps and the bunker. Uh, we had battery arrays and a number of different solar power systems. Between the bunker and the communication trailer is about 600 feet. So there's, there's multiple solar power systems along the way. Ed Korn, Steve Plock, Michael Lowe, and a lot of others spent many long hours installing electrical wiring and fittings to make the site operational. When the dish uh, movement was required for more power, or more power was needed for power tools, we had a 25 kilowatt propane generator available. So you can see the propane generator was installed in 2013. And in 2015, we trenched the entire 600 feet of the site and laid in the uh, uh, four strands of triple lock cable, uh, ethernet cables, control lines, and coaxial cables. In 2018, Scripp Creeley, a prominent RF entrepreneur, generously donated the money to bring the single phase power line over a mile to the site. Once this was attached, we, we had abundant 230 volt split phase power and we could spend less time maintaining solar cells, batteries and generators and more time on radio experiments. So thank you, Skip. So some of our accomplishments uh, since taking over the site, we have the solar power systems, the generator UPS, the electrical infrastructure throughout the facility, utility power restored, emergency telephone installed, internet connection, dish control system, dish celestial and moon tracking system, the antenna feed and the, uh, with fiber optic and coax connections, restroom facilities, underground facilities, the sump pumps for the underground facilities, uh, 14646 talk in radio and intercom, uh, radio astronomy, software defined radio, itty bitty telescope for educational purposes, and feed construction for 408, 1420, and 1296 megahertz, and many others. In order to drive the dish, we had to come up with dish motor and drive controls. The uh, group that came down from Boulder uh, found some uh, drive motors and control systems, and they were able to install those and get some stuff working. But we still didn't really have the uh, detailed controllers that drive the dish to a specific location or track an object across the sky as Earth moves. So we had a kind of a runoff between two systems. We had system one by one group uh, led by uh, Dave Mulder and Glenn Davis and system two uh, by the other group uh, led by Ed Johnson and Ray Uberekin. Uh, the system one team uh, brought on some software engineers and they were able to get something to work pretty well. We have both systems working, but we still have a few bugs in the system two, so we haven't got it installed right now. Uh, one of the problems was the, the ethernet connection would get lost in the middle 
and sometimes it would just take off on us. So we're trying to resolve that. So the, the dish now is fully capable of doing tracking. And so what I would do is, um, is play you a YouTube video, if I can make this work, which it won't. <laughs> Here we go. And tell me if uh, you can't hear the music on this. I'd say the thing I have to do is make my sound work. Did everybody hear the video? Yep, no problem. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, courtesy of a new member that we just got, uh, Mark Slo uh, Slover. He's a, uh, a master photographer, and he has a website on YouTube called Road Trip Ventures, if you want to see some more videos like that. He's an uh, expert in, uh, in stop motion and that sort of thing. Okay, somebody's got an open mic. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the rest of the facility. We have an underground uh, bunker, what we call the underground. Uh, a lot of people don't want, it, want us to call it a bunker because they think it's something to hide out in. But uh, in the underground, when Ray went down there, here's Ray you reckon, in uh, 2014, this is what they found. Uh, the whole thing was full of tumbleweeds. It's there again. The tumbleweeds are back. We have to uh, dig all those out of there every year, several times, and before we get to the door of the underground. When you get in, we've got a pretty large room down there. There's, there's probably about 1,500 square feet of uh, living space down in the bunker. We've got benches, and we've got a tool shop, and, and bathroom, and a number of facilities in the underground. One of the problems we have with it is, is it floods. The uh, ramp going down there where the tumbleweeds were, uh, someone took out all of the, uh, during that time that the site lay dormant, someone stole all of the bricks, the uh, cinder block bricks that were holding back the hillside. And so now the hillside wants to uh, erode and the mud runs down under the door and into our facility. So what the guys did was uh, started building a new wall to hold back all of that uh, mud, and that's what they're doing there. Also, we build a uh, an extra hatch in the uh, in the underground to get out of in case we had a fire in the front, and that's got a spiral staircase that was built by Ed Corn and Steve Flock uh, to uh, get out of there. Let's talk a little bit about feed antennas. We've got the the big dish, but then how do you drive the big dish? So uh, Ray has kind of been our our feed guy. 
Ray and Steve, and uh, there's Ray there uh, smiling up on the tower. Uh, here we've got a, uh, a feed for uh, uh, four, 408 megahertz that we do uh, as pulsar work with. And this other feed is for 12, I believe it's a 1296 or the 1420 uh, feed uh, for doing either uh, tropostatic or for doing uh, hydrogen line. There on the table is uh, one of the one of the feed antennas with the mounting uh, system that Ray devised. It's a quick release mounting system that we can change the feed out in about oh maybe half an hour if uh, we got two people on the tower. There's some more of the feeds there uh, showing uh, some of Ray's uh, ingenuity. This one's made out of a dog dish and a cake pan. Uh, Ray, if you're out there, maybe you could tell us uh, what is the frequency of that feed. This other little one is a, uh, a five gigahertz speed that we're going to use to acquire geosynchronous satellites so we can align the dish perfectly to the known position of geosync sat satellite. And then this other picture shows the uh, 408 uh, Yagi type feed looking down into the dish. And if you, it, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a wire mesh on the structure. And then the dipoles are out here in front of that wire mesh. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a video that shows what it takes to change out a feed. Let's see if I can do this. And maybe. Just a second. There we go. Okay, we'll get a kick out of this. So there you can see, that's Ray Uberekin. He's up on the tower, he's in a climbing harness, and that's uh, Floyd Glick there helping him. And uh, Ray straps on right there to a turnbuckle on the tower, and he walks around and gets in front of the feet. While we're here, you can kind of see the whole facility. This is the generator shack there down the middle and a propane tank. And then that uh, building material down there is where the bunker is. That's 600 feet from where the red truck is down to the communication trailer. All these people standing around on the bottom are there to pick up Ray after he falls off of this tower. Surprisingly, the structure is so strong that even with it sticking out this far, you know, it's about 35 feet off of the axis point, uh, you can hardly move that at all. Uh, you get no, almost no deflection while you're hanging onto that thing. And if you fell, it would just uh, support you there. Ray said when he was up there, he says, you know, I was doing pretty good until that swarm of bees came up on, off of my left shoulder and that kind of distracted me a little bit uh it was hard to work <laughs> but that's what the drone sounds like when you're up there is a swarm of bees it's pretty windy this day uh, you notice the little thing coming in to the left side of the screen that's the uh that's the landing foot of the drone uh coming into view because the the camera is gyro stabilized but the uh, wind is blowing the drone wing around pretty dramatically. And so the foot of the drone keeps showing up in the video. Okay. So for radio astronomy, we can do, um, we've got the high gain 60 foot dish. We can do hydrogen line, which is at uh, 1.42 gigahertz. Uh, we've got a radio drove receiver, which does uh, natural radio signals from Jupiter. And uh, as IO rotates around Jupiter, it creates radio signals. That's in the 15 megahertz to 22 megahertz band. Uh, SuperSIDS which is sudden uh, ionospheric disturbance 
monitor uh, showed significant solar flares and events. That's from uh, three to 30 kilohertz. And for SETI, we sit around the hydrogen line at 1.42 gigahertz, um, and we look for extraterrestrials. Uh, Skip is pretty much in charge of that. Steve Clock and him has uh, been working on that project, and they've got a lot of uh, simultaneous um, synchronized signal detections from Green Bank, Haswell, and now Skip's new observatory in New Hampshire. Skip wrote a paper called Geographically Spaced Synchronized Signal Detection. And this is what I was just talking about. The, uh, if you think about a signal received in Haswell from an object and a signal received 1,200 miles away in Green Bank, West Virginia, the, uh, if you receive a simultaneous signal in those two places, that signal has to originate somewhere outside the orbit of Mars. So it's unlikely that a terrestrial signal or something in Earth orbit would give you a detection of both sig of both observatories at the same time. And so that's what Skip is doing here. And he wrote a paper about it for Sarah, and it's called Geographically Spaced Synchronized Signal Detection System. We have this on our, on our website, and you can look it up and uh, read it if you want. It's kind of interesting. We also do H1 or hydrogen line emissions. Uh, this occurs when uh, the uh, electron orbiting the, uh, the nucleus of the atom of hydrogen, after about 10,000 years, the electron flips polarity. And when it does that, a photon is emitted, and that's a little radio signal at 1420.406 uh, megahertz. You don't think that's very big, but there's so much hydrogen out there in the uh, universe that it generates a quite a bit of emissions and we can receive that with this dish, pick it up with a device called a spectrocyber, which is a very unique receiver that centers around 1420-406. And uh, we can see the Doppler shift of whether that hydrogen that we're measuring is moving towards us or away from us. And that's what the little graph over here shows. Uh, the center line is the 1420 uh, megahertz. And on either side is a deviation. And so on the, on the right side, it's uh, blue shifted, so it's moving towards us. On the left side, it's red shifted, so it's moving away from us. Or maybe I said that wrong. Well, I think that's right. Um, so we, we see quite a bit of uh, signal strength on this, and uh, we're able to map uh, the, the neutral hydrogen in the Milky Way. and. Uh, we can see things. So what we can do with that is we can map the Milky Way galaxy. So this is a map that uh, Rich made with amplitude in, in color versus the galactic longitude and the galactic latitude for the hydrogen signal. Uh, let me move on to pulsar detection. Incidentally, on that hydrogen signal, uh, one of the things Rich has done with this is he's actually uh, taken that to the next level mathematically and was able to derive the mass of the Milky Way galaxy from the uh, Doppler shift of the, the galaxy arms that can be detected with this method. And so that's quite interesting and he was within 5% of the professional uh, measurement. Any questions on that before I move on? Okay. Okay, here's a, uh, the setup for detecting pulsars. Uh, pulsars are neutron stars that are rotating and generate massive magnetic fields that generate radio signals. And so we can detect pulsars in a broad band of frequencies. We chose uh, around the 408 megahertz frequency uh, for our antenna system to do pulsars. You can detect them across a, a pretty broad range of frequencies. But this is our setup. So we have a tracking computer. We have a, uh, a computer that is measuring the amplitude coming from the, uh, the receiver. And we have a, a computer that is doing the post processing and then a computer that's doing all of our side calculations to figure out what to look at next. I'm gonna play a real quick item here on what it looks like to do a pulsar detection if I can get this to work. Hey, we got it. You got it? Where? Look, right there. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. 
<laughs> this is uh, B1508 plus 55. New Pulsar. Yep. September 12, 2020. Deep Space Exploration Society, Plushner Radio Telescope. Excellent. Way to go. This is number nine. This is uh, number nine. Okay, I hope you were able to hear that. Um, so that's kind of what it's like to detect one. We, uh, we can't hear it, uh, but what we do is uh, the software programs, as you can see here, they fold it. So here's three different pulsars. They have different periods, uh, 714 milliseconds, 253, 1187. Those are kind of uh, some, of the, some of the pulsar uh, frequencies that we see. If uh, we could hear it, you, know, you need a uh, larger dish, a cryogenically cooled uh, feed system, and a lot of gain. And if you could hear it, you would, uh, let's see, I can play you this uh, video here. And that will show you what it would sound like. We have several on this video. broad range of um, pulsars that uh, you can hear, broad range of different sounds, and that all depends on the frequency, the angle they're coming in at, and uh, some of them even have kind of a double sound. Uh, Bill? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you might want to comment on the size of a pulsar. Yeah, a pulsar, most of these pulsars are quite small, uh, maybe uh, six miles in diameter. And these things have the mass of maybe 10 suns. Um, so if you think about that density, uh, if you stood on the surface of a pulsar, you'd be squished flat into a, a glob of glue, and then you'd be spread out to an infinitesimally thin uh, sheet. If you want to know more about pulsars, there's a YouTube here. This guy, uh, when we put up the video, you can, uh, you can take a look at it. But he describes that, and uh, one of the most dense uh, objects in the uh, in the uh, universe, and the only thing denser might be a black hole. Bill, yep. Does the pulse spacing vary in time, or is it constant? It actually varies in time as uh, the pulsar decays. It's giving off energy, and as it gives off energy, it has to slow down. So over time they slow down, but sometimes they're in a they're with a companion star. They're in a in a, uh, a binary, and they siphon um, material off of the binary star in order to maintain their um, their momentum. They speed up. So sometimes they speed up if they're with a companion star, but they actually do slow down, and that rate of uh, decay is measurable and can tell you the age of the pulsar. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about amateur radio. Uh, we can do uh, tropospheric scatter, uh, communication of microwave or long distances over the horizon, EME moon bounce, uh, 1296. We do HF radio, VHF, UHF, microwave radio. And uh, I think uh, we're working on something beyond 1296 right now, probably uh, 2204. So we have quite the uh, range of, of radio capability. Right now, we're not doing too much six meter, unfortunately, for the group. But we do have that capability. We could do it. 
here's our radio station. The radio station is called K0PRT after Paul uh, Plushner Radio Telescope, or the Plushner Radio Telescope. Uh, we have a tip-down tower that Ed Korn built for us. Um, it works really well, uh, and we need it to work really well because we have a beam here that's not very strong, and the winds out there in Haswell are ferocious. And this beam, uh, often the beams get twisted on the, uh, the main uh, structure, and we have to let the antenna down and straighten it. Uh, that long stick on the top is the 440 um, stick for our talk-in radio. And we have that on all the time, whether we're there or not. If you're in the area and you call on 44646 and somebody's in one of the, one of the facilities along the way there, they'll uh, answer you back on the telephone. We also have a, uh, a four-band uh, vertical out there uh, near the uh, tower, and we use that quite a bit. Gary uh, Agronaut is the uh, main operator out there, but everybody can use it. Uh, this is the uh, radio station down in the bunker, and uh, we have quite the capability, and we've participated in a number of special events and contests. Let's talk a little bit about EME. To do EME, we have to climb, climb the scaffold. They put the, uh, the uh, 1296 feed on the uh, on the feed point, put it off. We have quite a bit of uh, equipment. There's a 200 uh, watt amplifier at the feed point. There's a uh, 20 dB uh, uh, amplifier for the receive side in the uh, feed point, set of relays that transfers from transmit to receive so we don't burn out our amplifier. And uh, we use a uh, uh, ASU uh, receiver for 1296 down in the shack. Uh, we've got the computers tracking the moon there. And uh, that's what it's all set up to be. I'm going to play you a video of, um, let's do one where I'm going to play two. One is uh, Myron and just talking without too much Doppler shift so he can hear his own echo. And we're going to play that one. CQ, K0 Papa, Radio Tango, Delta Mike 88, Colorado. Got somebody? No. Thank you. Oh, CQ, 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 K0 Papa, Radio Tango, K0 PRT, K0 Papa, Radio Tango, Delta Mike 88, Colorado. Over, over. <laughs> you know, there you can see that the uh, he's actually hearing his own echo at the speed of light to the moon and back about two and a half seconds, and uh, that's quite exciting when you first do that. Uh, here, I'm going to play another video here where Gary's doing a QSO with uh, uh, one of the stations in uh, California. going to get out of this one in a minute. This shows you the echo as well. Let me play the right one here. Here's the one with the uh, single sideband. Whiskey 6, Yankee X-Ray. Whiskey 6, Yankee X-Ray. Kilowatt 0, Papa, Radio Tango. Kilo 0, Papa, Radio Tango. Whiskey 6 Yankee X-Ray, Kilowatt 0 Papa, Radio Tango. Kilowatt 0 Papa, Radio Tango. Roger, copy your Charlie Mike 87, your Charlie Mike 87. We are at Delta Mike 88, Delta Mike 88. 
Delta Mike 88, and I read you 5x4, 5x4 in Southeast Colorado, Southeast Colorado. Whiskey 6 Yankee X ray, kilowatt zero Papa, radio tango. How copy? Roger, we're running 200 watts, 200 watts with a 60 foot uh, dish antenna, 60 foot dish antenna. We are restored radio telescope site, restored radio telescope site in southeast Colorado. That's 200 watts, 200 watts with a 60 foot dish antenna. How copy? I'm going to truncate that for time, but uh, you kind of get the idea there that uh, off the moon, we're single sideband and uh, running 200 watts and He's reading this five by five. I think uh, Skip could verify that because we also had a QSO with uh, Skip up in Alberta uh, and he read us very well up there too. Okay, let me jump to education and outreach. Uh, we hold an annual open house um, with the, for usually in August with the Perseid meteor shower. Sometimes that doesn't work out too well because it doesn't fall on a weekend. Uh, we do optical radio astronomy demonstrations, the Pikes Peak Science Fair publications on radio and radio astronomy, uh, society for amateur radio astronomers, site trips to national radio observatories, website with all the proceedings and articles open to the public, and membership of student participants. I'll show you a little bit about that. Uh, here's uh, some pictures from our annual August open house. Um, where we're doing some optical uh, solar uh, astronomy. Uh, we're demonstrating the itty bitty telescope made from a dish network dish. We usually feed everybody breakfast when they come out and everybody sits around and talks about ham radio and radio astronomy and has a good time. In education, we uh, sponsor uh, some special awards in the Pikes Peak Regional Science Fair. Uh, last year we had a, a student that uh, we mentored a little bit, uh, but he pretty much took it and ran with it, took some of our data set for hydrogen line and uh, wrote a paper about it and presented a science fair project on it. He went to a uh, state competition and won a number of awards, uh, Xander Duvall. In uh, the 2019 Sarah Western Conference, we uh, had a young man, uh, Hans Gainsborough, that uh, uh, gave a presentation on a modified uh, SDR radio. And he did such a great job on that that he got a standing, ova uh, standing ovation from all of these uh, senior radio astronomers. It, was there a question out there? I heard somebody come in. Okay, and Dr. Rich Russell, uh, when we have the open house, he set up an extensive radio astronomy education certification program. I'd like to also say that, uh, that Rich also does a lot of education during our science meetings. We have a science meeting uh, once, a, uh, once a month, and Rich usually presents a good science paper at that, and everybody learns something. We also do a lot of public outreach. Uh, Gary Abernock and myself have been do going to uh, Haswell and Eads in the local area and giving presentations to the locals. Uh, we want to do this mainly because uh, a lot of them are wondering what we're doing down there. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're open and uh, transparent about everything that we do so that they don't wonder. And it also kind of protects our site. Uh, we also do outreach with the Society of uh, Amateur Radio Astronomers and participate quite extensively in that group. So that's about all I have. Uh, we have meetings 
Now the engineering operations meeting meets every second Monday of the month at 530 uh, Mountain Time. The science meeting is every fourth Monday of the month at 530 Mountain Time. Our uh, site work trip is our standing schedule is every third Saturday, leaving El the Ellicott Fire Station at 730. Uh, but we always have to watch the website and watch the communication for that because the weather can change it and also people's schedules change it. So we do a number of uh, site trips. Uh, lately, it's been more than one a month, but uh, we often go to the site and do work. The site's about two, two and a half hours from Colorado Springs. You can join the DSES for $50 a year for full voting membership, uh, or you can join by PayPal on our website, uh, dses.science. And that's all I've got. I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Hey, Bill, what are you gonna be doing that 2304 stuff? I don't know, I think that um, we're gonna uh, have to build the uh, feed. I don't, I don't, I think Ray, did you, is Ray on? I think he uh, has already built a 2304 feed or 2204, the 22 uh, or 22. Go ahead, Ray. Okay, uh, we don't have the feed done yet, but the uh, transverter or the actually the complete station was, uh, I tested that this evening before uh, this meeting and it's working fine. And so we're getting about 60 watts output out of the uh, receiver or the transceiver. Basically that's the way we'll use it as a transceiver. And uh, it'll be mounted right up at the feed is GAN. So we'll have about 60 watts on 2304 and a very low noise figure. So uh, we should do moon bounce very well. And we'll do that for sure this next coming September, but probably uh, in between, we'll even put the feed up there and, and try it sometime to uh, just test it out. Bill, Bill is, is your funding supplied by the membership only? Pretty much. Yeah, once in a while we'll get a big donation like when we got the power line donation. Uh, uh, Lauren Libby, one of our members donated the money for our propane we were running off the generator. So we have a few large things, but most of it's just membership fees. You do Bill, fantastic you, with it. Bill, does your group have to pay property tax since you're a charity? We do. Uh, we pay the property tax in the uh, Kiowa County on the site, but it's very low because it's it's zoned as rural farmland, basically, and it's not zoned for us as a commercial thing. So uh, we do pay property tax, but it's very low. About ten dollars a year. Yeah, yeah. Myron's our treasurer there, and uh, he pays that uh, bill to the property tax. Has the date been set for the August uh, open house? We'll have to look at when the Perseid meteor shower is. It kind of floats around there. If it uh, falls in the middle of the week, uh, we'll probably put it on one of the adjacent weekends. So, Bill, any idea why? Uh... I always wondered this, why did they have a bunker way back when, when well, that thing that way? Well, two reasons. In the, in the summertime, it's hotter than hell down there. And in the wintertime, it's cold. <laughs> so the bunker is kind of a, uh, a neutral place to be. And um, part of it, was, too, was they had a lot of equipment that was on that bench that you saw in that room. And I think the bunker was a, a good... Uh, heat sink for a lot of that heavy transmitting equipment uh, just dissipated it into the uh, into the walls of the bunker and uh, it kept it cool in the summer. Yeah, Bill, they also lived in that uh, all the time. They had showers and, and a galley down there as well. That's true. Yeah. And we, we kind of do that too. We've got, there's a bathroom down there. Uh, we just have a portage on because we, we haven't taken the time to rework the septic system. There is a septic system, but we haven't reworked it. Um, there was a massive uh, cistern for water, and that's still there. And we don't use that water. We use our own cisterns. We have uh, plastic, those 500-gallon uh, plastic containers, and we have three of them. 
we have 1500 gallons of water on site. Um, but it has a little kitchenette and uh, plenty of space to lounge around in. We've got a tool room and a machine room where we've got a bandsaw and a drill press and that sort of thing. So we're pretty capable on site. Uh, we're getting more and more tools on site all the time, so we'd have to haul less with it. One of the things about going to the site is you don't want to go down there without everything available to do the work you're going to do because it's a long way back to get it. I didn't realize it was so big. You know, I've seen pictures before, but I didn't realize it was that big under there with all those different rooms. So that's interesting. Yeah. Didn't, they sure built it a long ways away from the dish, though, didn't they? He says it seems like a long ways. Yeah, they did. And they actually ran a uh, very large coax from that room, or several of them, all the way up to the dish. So they had 600 feet of this massive coax and multi strands in a, uh, in a wooden cable lay along the ground. That's kind of been our nemesis now because that wooden cable lay has deteriorated and rotted to nothing and all the nails in it are starting to spread out on the ground and they get on the road. So we have a lot of flat tires. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you suppose they needed a 600 foot distance? I don't know. Ray, do you, do you know why they did that? Well, uh, remember that the site, the dish was built on the site after it had already become operational for other reasons. And uh, so the tall tower, the 500 foot tower and the underground bunker were very close to each other in the middle of this big square property. But uh, when they put the dish on, they actually add a little corner to it, another little square on the corner. And uh, so the dish came along after the site was already built. Ah, that would explain it. They didn't want to build another bunker under the, under the dish. But we don't run it that far. We run about 100 and about 200 feet from our communication trailer to the top of the dish um, with coax. So uh, that's that's pretty short distance uh, compared to what they have. Yeah, the trader was a was a nice find, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, that came from uh, where did that come from? The Department of Commerce and the Radio Telephone and Something Institute. And so aluminum trailer, uh, now that's that's kind of a problem because it gets very hot. It's this an aluminum bake box. We've seen, uh, we had a remote uh, temperature sensor in there one summer and had it hooked up to the internet and we could read it from afar as well as some of our experiments. And uh, we saw temperatures in there of 160 degrees. Good grief. But now we've got some just... fans and some exhaust fans and some air conditioners and uh, so we're trying to keep the temperature in there down so we don't cook our equipment. Bill, did you say Table Mountain was north of uh, Boulder? Yeah, it's north of Boulder, about 10 miles, about 10 miles straight west of Longmont. Okay, I was talking to Paul about that earlier. I was under the impression it was either north or south Table Mountain at Golden. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's a south Table Mountain, but it's not that one. It's north Table Mountain. I learn something every day. Uh, Bill, I was just wondering about the, the data rates and the bandwidths that you have between uh, the telescope and your computer facilities in the bunker. Make any comment on that? Well, the uh, we we really we we only have an Ethernet connection, uh, standard you know like 10, 10 meg Ethernet connection between the comm center and the bunker. And so we don't really do any operations on the dish from the bunker where everything's done in the, in the comm trailer. Um, we do have fiber optic cable to the feed point uh, in, the, uh, in the telescope to the comm trailer. And so we can do uh, pretty high speed stuff on fiber optic as well as coaxial cable. We have uh, like a three quarter inch hard line coaxial cable to, uh, to the feed point. Thanks. Well, that's uh, great, uh, Bill. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this for us tonight. And uh, it's been very interesting. And <clears throat> I'd like to uh, go down there myself sometime when you guys are uh, 
doing some uh, EME work and uh, at least uh, get to hear my own echo. That'd yeah, that's, that's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, we're, uh, we're open to membership. Anybody wants to join, uh, we do have a uh, lower cost non-voting membership that you can join with. Uh, what we're looking for is more and more people to go down and do work. Um, right now, the organization consists of somewhere it's variable between 50 and 65 people. But generally, there's only about 15 core members that are doing most of the work on the site. And so uh, anybody that wants to join and go to the site and do stuff, uh, we're, you're more than welcome. Well, that's great. So, uh, if you want any more data about some of these items like EME and, and hydrogen line and radio astronomy and all the things we're doing, if you click on that, uh, that DSES.science, we publish everything we do. And so there's archives there of all the meetings, uh, all of the papers that we're writing. Uh, there's a lot of information out there on that website. That's great, Bill. And uh, yeah, I, I was at, uh, I listened in on one of your science uh, um, meeting, uh, Zoom meetings, and it was very, very interesting. I learned a lot. Well, thanks very much, Bill, for all your time tonight. And uh, this is being recorded and uh, we will uh, uh, have it on the, uh, uh, on the, on the uh, uh, group.io um, uh, in, uh, in a message uh, probably tomorrow. Thanks again, everybody, for, uh, for joining us tonight. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thanks for presentation. Thanks, Bill. Great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. A lot of fun. <laughs>